Hello and welcome to the People's Platform Special International Edition. My name is Sonali Waniga Baduge and uh, through our media network of the Capital Maharaja Group at News First, we have continually strived to keep uh, people informed, to have informed discussions around areas of national importance in a bid to uh, influence and drive um, decision-making that is scientific, inclusive, aligned with the principles of dignity and ultimately the best interests of the people of Sri Lanka. To, uh, today's uh, discussion is focused on ushering in Sri Lanka's economic recovery in a holistic manner. I'm incredibly honoured to be in the company of some of the world's top minds, luminaries in their respective fields. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be a part of this uh, discourse. Let me very briefly introduce uh, our panel panel of guests to you. Uh, Professor Guy Standing joining us from Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, he's the research professor at SOAS, University of London, formerly director of the Socioeconomic Security Program at the ILO in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, he's also the author of several books, uh, the latest books uh, of which include The Blue Commons, Rescuing the Economy of the Sea, Battling Eight Giants, Basic Income Now. We are also joined by Professor Radhika Balakrishnan, who joins us from New York, USA. She functions as Professor of Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Rutgers University, also was the former president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. We are also joined by uh, Professor Muthukumara Swami Raja, joining us from Jaffna, Sri Lanka. Uh, he's the Emeritus Professor of Law at the National University of Singapore. Again, an author of multiple books, multiple journal articles. Uh, and finally, we are joined by Professor Shanta Devarajan. Uh, professor Devarajan is a professor of the practice of international development at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of uh, Foreign Service. He was previously at uh, the World Bank, currently functions as uh, an advisor on debt restructuring and multilateral engagement on behalf of the Sri Lankan government. Fantastic to have you uh, on this edition of the program. My first question uh, I would like to direct to Professor Shanta Devarajan. Um, Professor, initially in Sri Lanka, the International Monetary Fund was demonized on political stages and after last year's exacerbation of the economic crisis and after Sri Lanka declared bankruptcy, the IMF was looked to as um, the savior of Sri Lanka from its economic wars. Uh, at present, it is reported that the extended fund facility is scheduled to be signed. Could you put this in perspective for our viewers by also taking us through how much Sri Lanka's debt is in contrast and also speak to how Sri Lanka must also have its own set of economic uh, revival strategies, uh, its own game plan without solely relying on the good graces of the IMF? Okay, thank you. It's again, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to talk about these very important issues. Uh, Sri Lanka's total debt is $84 billion. So this is less than 10%, uh, just that number. The specific amount on the uh, EFF, the Extended Fund Facility, is $2.8 billion. Uh, and that's over four years. But the most important thing, I would say, Sonali, is that the, the, the point of the EFF is, is not uh, to, to, to bail, what people say, bail out Sri Lanka, right? It is to permit Sri Lanka to undertake a debt restructuring. See, that $84 billion is too high for Sri Lanka to ever pay back. It's what's called unsustainable debt. Hmm. So Sri Lanka has to enter into negotiations with its creditors, both official creditors like China and India and Japan, as well as the private creditors, the international sovereign bondholders, in order to reduce the amount of debt that it owes. And usually the way that works is <clears throat> with an IMF program that, that sh both uh, looks at the Sri Lanka's policy framework and I uh, determines that it's uh, stabilizing in a, in a way that can permit debt restructuring, but more importantly that the, the, uh, there's a, the IMF undertakes what's called a debt sustainability analysis 
which is which is the IMF's technical view uh, of what is the level of debt that Sri Lanka can sustain. So the IMF, in that sense, is a is a neutral party between the creditors and the debtors, and presents that as the sustainable debt, and then. Sri Lanka can use that as the basis for negotiation with the creditors. And that's what we're hoping to do over the next 18 months to two years. Uh, thank you very much for setting the stage. Um, Professor Muthukumar Swami, Sorna Raja, I'd like to come to you with the next question. Um, uh, Sri Lanka has been in a constant struggle to appeal to bilateral and multilateral creditors, friendly neighbors, the IMF, the Paris Club, uh, inter alia to restructure debt, to default on debt, whilst balancing the raging fires within the country itself, uh, the political melodrama on the one hand, the clamoring of uh, various groups and their demands, the need to hold elections, the requirement to um, adhere to conditions by various parties, to uphold the rule of law, increased taxation, other deeply unpopular austerity measures. Uh, ultimately, it is the most vulnerable that suffer as a result of this. How do you think Sri Lanka must go about this process of economic recovery in, in a holistic manner? Finally, you suggested that uh, the IMF has been demonized by political parties within Sri Lanka. Uh, the reason for that, for that simply is that uh, many people think that uh, the solutions advanced by the IMF would uh, lead to a great deal of, uh, of uh, suffering for the people. And uh, that is pretty visible now, because in Sri Lanka now, we do find a uh, uh, vast amount of starvation it was reported in the newspapers that uh, some 7 million people uh, are without uh, means of sustenance, uh, means of feeding the poor. So this idea of giving a loan to the government uh, is based upon the theory that uh, somehow there would be some redemption that would take place because people would be confident of, uh, of uh, ensuring that there are flows of money from outside into Sri Lanka. This may not uh, take place. After all, uh, the, the Greece, for example, did attempt uh, uh, this strategy, and uh, it has taken about 13 years of, uh, of uh, stress uh, for the people, and uh, there is the, the recovery has been rather slow. So the, the fact is that uh, the uh, initiation of uh, uh, the IMF uh, strategies may not lead to uh, a, a happy recovery in uh, Sri Lanka. There would be continuation of suffering. There would be a period of uh, immense austerity in which uh, the increasing number of the poor in Sri Lanka are going to be hit by uh, suffering. So that's uh, the difficulty here. And uh, I, I support the view that uh, the IMF uh, is not a solution, that, uh, that it uh, brings to the country more strife than existed prior to the situation. Because the IMF loan leaves us with uh, the same problems. The leadership is going to remain the same. The leadership is known to be corrupt. The ethnic problem which has uh, affected our country for 75 years uh, has not been solved. There's an increased militarization. The fact that there is uh, a flow of $2.8 million is not going to solve the crisis. Today's Sunday Times uh, gives a very optimistic view that the dollar crisis is over. But uh, I don't think that any crisis is over. It's just the beginning of uh, more trouble in the country. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Professor Radhika Balakrishnan, um, bleak times ahead. Um, an economic crisis is a deeply human issue which requires humane solutions. But um, the dominant approach to economic recovery um, at times, and we've seen this, uh, 
uh, has been far removed from the issues that perhaps warrant urgent attention, such as extreme poverty, uh, widespread joblessness. You speak at length on the intersectionality between uh, economic policy and human rights. Could you speak to us about how human rights has the potential to transform economic thinking and policy making with far reaching consequences for social justice with social justice as the pivotal point thank you very much um i think we are at a moment i mean i think sri lanka is a great example of how the dominant framework of economics is not working uh, and we have so many examples, and, and uh, the COVID crisis ex exposed kind of the failures of, of the kind of dominant economic framework. So if we to do a normative shift, and, and I always ask this question, what is the economy for? Why, why do we participate in this economy? And if we said the, the reason why we participate is the fulfillment of human rights, then what will that economy look like? And what are the kind of economic policies that we need to put in place in order to fulfill uh, human rights obligations? And, and because we have international law uh, framed in, in, in human rights, we can actually go to those covenants and, and, um, and, and other instruments, human rights instruments, and then evaluate whether the kind of economic policy measures that are being put into place fulfill the kind of human rights obligations. And I know Sri Lanka has signed many uh, treaties, CEDAW, for example, and I think also the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and one of the obligations is for the state to use the maximum of available resources to fulfill its human rights. We can then go back and look at the way in which the government has used its resources, the, the tax cuts that, that have taken place that has reduced the amount of resources they had, and also the austerity programs that the IMF still seems to think is the, is the answer to most questions. It can be judged in terms of looking at uh, human rights norms and, and obligations. So I think what we need is a real global shift in understanding what the economy is for. And if we say that if that the fulfillment of human rights, especially economic, social and cultural rights, are the way in which we evaluate the economy, we would come up with a very different set of paradigms than what's being proposed in the world right now. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my next question is to uh, Professor Guy Standing. You speak of the rapidly growing number of people facing lives of insecurity, moving in and out of jobs that give little meaning to their lives, from the delivery driver who brings you your packages, the cab driver who gets you to work, the security guard at the mall. In Sri Lanka too, we see um, this group of frustrated, angry uh, underclass that is oftentimes ignored by politicians. How must a better world be forged then, despite the grim realities? If you, I'd like you to focus on the humane aspect again. As far as uh, Shanta's opening remarks, which I found very useful and, and informative, I think one has to remember that this is the 16th time that Sri Lanka has gone with a virtual begging bowl uh, to the IMF since independence in 1948. It's the 16th time. And clearly the crisis today is a magnitude of what it has been in the past. It's very severe, as was mentioned. And we have one quarter of the population suffering from food insecurity, food poverty. And we have a situation which is not easily put into the context of just the IMF and the multilateral uh, lending institutions. Because, of course, since the last, well, last 20 years, a big new actor has come into the process. And that's China. And of course, you have your big white elephant projects, which have been linked to Chinese, I like the term quasi predatory uh, investments and loans, um, including, of course, the uh, Hambotata uh, uh, port, 
and the crazy airport that you've got in uh, near the ex-president's uh, town, and you, you've got the, the, the Colombo Lotus Tower, and you've got these various things which have created further debt. And when I was looking at the debt figures, I was, I was impressed by two things, and then I'll stop on these remarks. I was impressed by the fact that debt today, total foreign debt, and Shanta will correct me if, if I'm wrong, is, is well over 190% of GDP. Now, that clearly, as he was saying, is unsustainable. And at the same time, something close to 60% of foreign uh, debt is foreign currency debt. And that makes it increasingly uh, fragile, the whole situation. But I think I want to come back to my, the question you posed to me at this point, because my, the analysis that I've presented is an analysis that neoliberal economics started back in the 1970s with the, what we call the Chicago School and the neoliberal neo, uh, economics revolution. And that went for financial market liberalization, trade liberalization, and an export-led development model, and of course, ushered in a period where finance, global finance, has become all-powerful. And my analysis, and we come back to that later, is that this has ushered in a period of global financialized rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income and wealth is flowing to the owners of private property. And the development model that has been pursued has accentuated this with privatization and many other aspects which have strengthened the position of finance. In my own country of Great Britain, financial assets today are over 1,000% of GDP. Finance used to be the tail that would help, help with the economy, but it's actually become the dominant force. And that leads to the development of the precariat, which you mentioned earlier, which is the question you posed to me, because we've got, had in the process a dramatic decline in the amount of income going to those who perform labor and work, and a dramatic increase in the share of total income going to property owners, most of all finance. And this has created a really fragile international economy and a new class structure in which the growing mass class in every part of the world, including China, including the United States, Sri Lanka, Britain, wherever you go, are part of the precariat, facing chronic insecurities and extremely vulnerable to any economic shocks, whatever the cause, including covid including that's the sixth pandemic. And what we're living in is an era of uncertainty where the precariat is growing. And in a sense, Sri Lanka and countries like Sri Lanka are facing a perfect storm of being the, at the end point of so much financialized indebtedness. But the precariat is living in chronic debt that is the feature of being the precariat. So that any shock pushes millions more people into indebtedness, homelessness, suicidal tendencies, and so on. And this is a social phenomenon with have enormous political implications, uh, which we can come back to. But I think the whole process must be seen in a development model that is fundamentally flawed going back to the 1970s. Professor Shanta Devarajan, uh, could you comment on um, Professor Guy Standing's remarks? Thank you. Uh, I, actually, I have comments on uh, all the remarks up to now. Um, and, and let me elaborate a little bit. I, I, I realize I didn't answer your question about the economic policy framework uh, for the Sri Lanka's own, what Sri Lanka needs to do in order to uh, resume inclusive uh, growth. Uh, I, I think it's important, you know, a guy standing provided a, a, a global picture, but let's go back to Sri Lanka. Let's go back to what actually happened in Sri Lanka. And as Radhika said, uh, 
it, the tax cuts of 2019, where the tax to GDP ratio fell from 13% of GDP to 8% of GDP, created a huge hole in the budget. The fiscal deficit went, sh rose to 13% of GDP. And what's most important is that by March of 2020, the international uh, creditors had uh, downgraded Sri Lanka to near default status. Remember, this is March of 2020, which is before the COVID pandemic actually took hold in, in Sri Lanka. Already, Sri Lanka was cut off of, of, from capital markets. Now, what most countries do at that time, when that, faced with that situation, is seek an IMF program and seek to restructure their debt. Because the, the creditors have basically said, you can't pay back your debt. But Sri Lanka refused to do that. I think that was the big policy mistake. That they, they refused to do both. They refused to go to the IMF. And they refused to embark on a debt restructuring for two years. And during those two years, they paid back the creditors in full, the international sovereign bondholders in full, out of reserves, just drawing down their reserves because they couldn't get any new money. And they financed the fiscal deficit by borrowing from the central bank. So then by 2022, early 2022, remember, there's no IMF program, there's no debt restructuring. By early 2022, Sri Lanka ran out of reserves. Reserves were down to zero. And inflation was 50%, which is exactly what the textbooks will tell you. This is, this is orthodox neoclassical economics. I'm sorry, but this, 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 is, this is the policy that the, the government was following, right? So Sri Lanka had no choice but to default. And I should add that, you know, Guy mentioned the 16 IMF programs, you're right, but this is the first time that there was a default. The first time Sri Lanka actually defaulted on its debt. And, and then we know, we know what happened, right? The whole year, calendar year 2022, last year, growth fell by 9%. Uh, I mean, GDP fell by 9%, negative 9% growth. And inflation was 50% for the year. It's the worst year in Sri Lankan economic history, right? And all of this was before the IMF program. I mean, this was my, my conversations with the, uh, with the government, and I'll reveal, I mean, this is the previous government, uh, uh, I, you know, because I, I was for a year and a half trying to get them to go to the IMF and trying to get them to do a, a, a debt restructuring, and they kept refusing, saying, oh, well, the IMF will impose austerity. And what, what we saw was they, they were forced into austerity without the IMF program. I told that I, I, in one of my remarks to the former central bank governor, I said, you're doing an IMF program without the IMF money. You're doing it for free because you're forced into it. So this is the situation Sri Lanka was, faced, uh, was facing last year. So all of the policies that have been undertaken over the last year was to restore, restore Sri Lanka's macroeconomic stability in such a way that you can actually access some funds from the IMF, but also undertake that debt restructuring, which is going to be crucial to the, uh, the, uh, the, the recovery and, and, and fulfilling. And I fully agree with Radhika that the purpose of economic policy is to protect human rights. That is, that is the, the, the role of economic policy. The fact is that most economic policy in Sri Lanka has been going against that. And I, I don't mean just the, the, the trade liberalization. In fact, the trade liberalization actually uh, generated jobs and generated uh, uh, growth. The economic growth doubled after uh, the 1970 uh, liberalization. But let me just mention two or three active economic policies that we're trying to reform that, that uh, undermine human rights. The first is energy subsidies. You might be surprised to hear me say that, but the fact is that the energy subsidies, 40% of the energy subsidies go to the richest 20% of the population. 
So think about that. If you just took that same amount of money and gave it out equally to all Sri Lankan citizens, they would only get 20%. So the rich are getting double what they would get from, a, from an equal transfer, let alone if you were able to target that transfer to the, to the poor. But I think it, it actually is worse than that. Because if you try to protect the poor through energy subsidies, which is allegedly the reason for these subsidies, what you're telling a poor person is, if you want to get a benefit from the state, you have to consume fuel. Now compare that to a situation where you convert those subsidies into cash transfers and raise the price of fuel to market prices. Then the poor person gets the, and, and you target those transfers to the, to, the, uh, to the poor. Then the poor person has a choice of how to spend the money doesn't have to spend it on fuel. They can spend it on educating their kids. They can spend it on their business. They can spend it on their, 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 their improving their house, which is what they actually do. And there's evidence to, 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 to that effect. So th this is a, a, a cruel policy that you could do much better. The second one, just very quickly, is the Paddy Lands Act. Remember the Paddy Lands Act, it goes back to 1958. And what it does is it requires farmers who lease land from the state to grow paddy. Now, paddy happens to be the least lucrative crop in, among all crops in Sri Lanka. There's, they can make much more money growing other things. I remember once when I was in Sri Lanka, I read in the newspaper that a farmer was fined 75,000 rupees for growing bananas. So think about that. The farmer thought it was still worth it to grow bananas because he, he didn't want to grow, uh, he, he didn't want to lose money by growing, growing paddy. So we have, and 50% and of the farmers are, are, are growing paddy. So we have a situation where these farmers are poor because of government policy. We are, we are forcing them to grow paddy when they could be growing other things that make them more money, but it's against the law. So these are the policies that we need to reform if Sri Lanka is, is going to empower the poor. The poor have been discriminated against by active economic policies uh, throughout, uh, th throughout history. And it's actually a, quite remarkable that the few times when they've got something right, and I would defend the, the trade liberalization of the 1970s uh, as one of the things they got right, that's when poverty started declining and employment started growing. Okay, thank you. Um, before coming to uh, Professor Sornaraja, Professor Guy standing. The point I was making, Shanta, is actually not about the current end of the road crisis. That's your comments relating to that. Uh, we can discuss separately. I'm actually questioning the whole model that they've pursued through structural adjustment policies, supply side economics since the 1970s. And in my new book, The Blue Commons, I show how the IMF and the World Bank and the regional development banks all subsidized. And I totally agree with you on energy subsidies, but they all actually subsidized the creation and extension of privatization and imposed conditionalities that actually did, and the data are you know, overwhelmingly uh, strong in this regard, that tended to weaken the social state and rolled back, uh, including cash transfers, which I favor very strongly. And I think that you really have to say this development model, if you take, if you take fishing, they've, they've supported uh, private uh, export-oriented prawns and salmon and so on adventures, which have decimated mangroves around the world and uh, decimated fishing communities. Now, this is a big issue in Sri Lanka, but this, in many parts of the world, including most of Africa and, and Latin America, this IMF, World Bank kind of strategy of development, has actually weakened the social state, increased inequalities, and, and really corroded the capacity of the state to develop. That is the long-term critique of the IMF model. I tend to agree with many of the points you're making about the current situation, 
But the famous Irish joke that if you want to get to Dublin, you wouldn't start from here is, is appropriate when we're talking about this. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Sornaraja, um, Sri Lanka's current economic crisis has compelled it to reach out to international lenders and do to their bidding. However, altruism is certainly not in the equation. Sri Lanka at this juncture lacks any bargaining power whatsoever. How must the overall economic uh, recovery program be handled in a manner that is consonant with uh, ensuring the best interests of the country's citizenry, whilst also not antagonizing international lenders, whilst also ensuring that um, scientific um, expertise, economic expertise is prioritized uh, and, and that this whole program is kept away from political manipulation, which is the hardest part. Well, that's a long question, Sonali. There's a lot of features. <clears throat> but let, let me first start by saying that, uh, you know, when you shroud uh, a problem in so much of economics, you forget the political context in which the problem arose. The political context, ob obviously, is uh, was the existence of... Uh, of, uh, of particular political figures who were able to manipulate circumstances in order to capture power in Sri Lanka. And then, of course, uh, privilege small groups like uh, the Viet Maga, the businessmen who supported them, uh, ensuring that uh, there were uh, a lowering of taxes uh, for the rich uh, business classes in Sri Lanka. So one has to be conscious of the fact that there was a distinct political context in which uh, the events of the last few years took place. And when you shroud it in uh, economic terms, you completely dissociate uh, the political factors which generated this particular economic uh, situation. Now, as far as the IMF solution is concerned, it's pretty inevitable that there is a particular type of solution that it has to undertake. Because if you look at the, the terms of agreement at the IMF, Article 1, for example, it says that it shall promote uh, international trade, international investment, international finances, uh, uh, to ensure that there is liber liberalization of the flows of such uh, factors within the world. So what, what it mandates is a particular vision of, uh, of uh, economic development or, or, or of an economic uh, solution that uh, has ensured the flow of uh, wealth from the poorer countries to the richer countries. However much you may talk about human rights, you would find this phenomenon repeated in uh, international investment law, which I study and teach and have taught for a long period of time. You find the World Bank uh, having a, a particular uh, settlement uh, system, which ensures the protection of the right to property, ensures that uh, when privatization takes place, the shareholders who buy, uh, buy uh, the, uh, the shares of privatized companies, as happened in Argentina, are given protection. So there is a sort of a insurance of the flow of, uh, of uh, assets of the poor to the richer countries that uh, the uh, programs of uh, these international financial institutions uh, seek to achieve. And of course, in the financial field, what becomes worse is that, uh, that uh, many of the solutions that are put forward are put forward by uh, the banking uh, communities, and uh, they are foisted on the rest of the world as soft law and not as hard law. So you have the Basel Principles, for example, being uh, uh, formulated by uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bankers of the world, uh, of the rich world, getting together and ensuring that there is a program that uh, promotes uh, their best interests. So this human rights argument also is a difficult one because we find now that what is happening in international law is that there is a privileging of certain rights over other rights. Like, for example, the protection of the right to property, which, of course, is uh, a refuge of the very rich, uh, becomes privileged over the protection of the right to food. So these are uh, 
are factors that one observes taking place in modern times because of the intensity with which uh, the rich within the rich, rich world I intend, uh, are, uh, are keen on securing uh, their better interests. So in this context, I think the developing countries should have to take uh, an alternative view. And it's not as if there are no other solutions that are advanced. The General Assembly has a resolution on uh, uh, debt restructuring. UNCTAD has principles on debt uh, restructuring. There are new principles or, or, or existing principles of international law which uh, seek to uh, uh, seek to recognize the fact that not all uh, debts are the same, whereas the IMF seems to mandate the idea that all uh, all lenders must be paid at least uh, something back for their their loans. The the new principles try to sort of point out that there could be shylocks amongst uh, uh, the lenders, that lenders could be at fault, and that you must scrutinize the extent of the fault of the lenders. When you lend to governments which are corrupt, which are headed by people known to be uh, drive takers, there is a fault in the person who gives uh, the debt. So the issue becomes one whether, of, of one whether in terms of the law, the loan agreement, which is after all nothing more than a contract, has been secured in accordance with the principles of the law, both of the domestic law of Sri Lanka as well as the principles of international law. There are conventions on bribery in international law. There are conventions on human rights in international law which seek to protect the poor. All these factors have to be taken into account. So there are alternative models of development which are kept out because of the fact that you adopt uh, one particular way that is mandated by the uh, major international financial institutions of the world. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Sornaraja. Some very important points. Um, before coming to uh, Professor Radhika, I'd like to get Professor uh, Shanta Devarajan's perspectives on um, what Professor Sornaraja just said. First, I should be very clear. What I was talking about was politics. <laughs> I was talking about the, the, the bad economic decisions that were made because of politics. Why do you think they cut taxes? They don't just enjoy cutting taxes. It was to pay off certain biz powerful business interests that elected President Gotabaya Rajapaksa into power. Uh, the, the, and there's some concern that the reason why they delayed uh, uh, debt restructuring uh, and uh, 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 embarking on uh, an IMF program for two years uh, while starving the population was, again, politics. There were powerful elements within the country that would rise up against uh, uh, going to the, to the IMF. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about is pure politics. Now, let's go back to uh, the, the in both uh, uh, Guy Standing and Professor Sonaraja were uh, describing how the international system, from their point of view, how the international system may have conspired to create some of these problems. But let's not forget that many of the problems that Sri Lanka is facing today is the fault of the Sri Lankan government. And, and I think Guy mentioned the Hambantata port and all these other uh, white elephant projects. The decision to build that port was a Sri Lankan decision. And just you know, parenthetically, I might add that the Chinese didn't force them to take a loan on that uh, on Hambantota port. Sri Lanka, the, the Sri Lankan government, the Mahindra Rajapaksa government, wanted to build this port they tried the UK, and the UK said no. They tried Denmark. The Denmark said no. And it's only then that they went to the Chinese, and the Chinese were the only ones who would agree to finance it. So it was hardly something that the Chinese forced on the Sri Lankans. It was the Sri Lankan who forced it on themselves. And then let me just take one, uh, two points about this undermining of the social state that uh, Guy mentioned. Uh, and several people have talked about the problems of privatization. And again, let's keep in mind that the, the, what, is, what there is of the social state in Sri Lanka, and there's been a long tradition of social welfare in Sri Lanka, is horribly implemented. 
Just take Samurdi, the flagship cash transfer program in the country, right? 60% of those receiving Samurdi transfers are not poor. And 60% of the poor are not receiving Samurdi transfers. It is horribly mistargeted. And it is politically captured. I mean, we have evidence that the Niyamakas are told, you know, do not give these transfers if the family voted for the opposition party in the last election. So the, 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 the Sri Lanka is a, is a case of where the social state is actually failing. And we need to fix that. Um, and then finally, just one point on privatization. Uh, I fully agree that privatization has, has had lots of problems in lots of countries around the world. But think of the alternative, which is these loss-making state-owned enterprises. And those are costing enormous amounts of money. Take Sri Lankan Airlines, just the one thing, the airline, costs 1% of GDP in subsidies. That's huge. And why do they still keep it? I mean, why do they still think, do you think the poor person living in the village in Ratnapura uh, actually cares that there's an airline with the Sri Lankan flag on it that is our national airline? And think about how much you can do to help that poor person with 1% of GDP. So we, we can't just di dismiss privatization because it's had some problems before without thinking about how much it's costing us not to privatize. Thank you. Um, Professor Radhika, firstly, if you have any remarks on uh, what the speakers just said, um, my question to you is, uh, Sri Lanka's present situation demonstrates the manner in which um, unjust policy and unconscionable political leadership uh, and definitively with little or no uh, accountability can victimize and has victimized the citizens of uh, the country who had no active role to play in it except for casting their votes. Um, going forward, how do we reconcile this massive disconnect between the fact that Sri Lanka now needs to go in for an economic uh, recovery process, uh, which will be quite rigid, uh, and the austerity measures will be uh, very strongly felt by the most vulnerable uh, communities in Sri Lanka, when that is itself a priority? Uh, thank you. I, I do want to comment on, on several of the uh, points that were uh, raised. Um, I mean, I have to agree uh, wholeheartedly with guys, um, uh, you know, um, bringing up of the financialization of the, of the world economy. And, you know, I think Oxfam just came out with a report that said that the richest 1% uh, bagged nearly twice as much wealth of, as the rest of the world put together. So there's something really structurally wrong with the way our economic system is functioning. And, and you know, if we were to tax them about 5%, we would probably get the entire world's poor out of poverty. So uh, I, I, I think we need to look at it in the context of, of the larger uh, economic system and where we're going uh, worldwide. I also wanted to, to address issues about uh, the the export orientation and the trade liberalization. Uh, the last time I was in Sri Lanka was a, a while ago, but we did a long project on uh, the subcontracting of workers when uh, trade was liberalized. And, and one of the things we found in the research we did was just a very uh, direct connection between the attempt to break union power in, in Sri Lanka with subcontracted workers because you moved workers out of large-scale unionized places to small uh, households. And the research we did was looking at, at what subcontracting did in terms of women's labor. And, and what we found was that there was a direct link of decreasing union power, getting rid of social protection, uh, getting rid of any kind of pension plan for these workers in the name of export-oriented trade liberalization. And that has continued in Sri Lanka since we did the, the study uh, about a decade ago. And so I think we, we need to look at not just what 
uh, this current moment, but what are the policies that led to this current moment? And, and what are the kind of social protection programs that were decimated in this liberalization and the role of outside actors within uh, Sri Lanka's economy? I mean, if we look at, you know, I mean, we, we looked at the garment industry, we looked at tea, uh, and in each of these places, what we saw was this sort of export oriented liberalization that, Shanta, you talked about increasing employment, but the kind of employment that was increased was not the same as unionized, well-protected, pensioned jobs that everyone we interviewed wanted. They didn't want these these subcontracted jobs. Um, and so to, to go to your, your, your question about, you know, what do we do in in these moments, I mean, I think we're the, that's a question not just for Sri Lanka, but I think worldwide. You know, we keep uh, electing governments. I mean, I live in the United States, and and the last election we elected uh, governments that don't quite represent the interests of, of most people. But I think we need to take very seriously the idea of of accountability, transparency, and participation. As, as, a, as an important part of how we make democratic systems. Do I have an easy answer as to how we're going to do that? Uh, I don't have an easy answer. And I think Sri Lanka in its history has had such complicated uh, issues in terms of, of um, you know, in terms of, of democratic participation. Uh, but I think the the social welfare state has been diminished. I, I don't think we can say that it hasn't. It has been decreased. And Sri Lanka used to have a fairly robust uh, social welfare state. You know, corruption taken. Uh, in, but that doesn't mean that that model needs to be uh, reduced to saying, oh, it, it just doesn't function. Yes, the airline industry uh, didn't function very well. But that doesn't mean that you get rid of state-owned uh, enterprise. I mean, the, and what what are the basic tenets of state-owned enterprise that might benefit people? Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say was also going back to the issue of austerity. Uh, you know, the the implications of austerity in terms of the of the gendered implications are huge. And feminist economists have been writing about this for for decades. That you know, when you cut education, you cut health care, there's an assumption that women's labor just kind of expands and absorbs all the needs of, of people when you cut the, the, the spending on, on those essential issues. And, and it seems like, you know, uh, the IMF, especially in, in this iteration, has not read any of this literature and just going back to the same cookie cutter approach uh, that hasn't worked. And I think the the gendered implications are really important for us to take into account uh, in critiquing the government and the IMF policy. I think we need to look at both. Thank you very much. Professor Guy Standing, you have some remarks? Um, yeah, I want to come back to the, the destruction of the social state over the last 40 years. <laughs> I was due to come to Sri Lanka on the 26th of December, 2004. And on that day, of course, the tsunami struck. I had my, literally was at Geneva airport ready to come and I was going to be staying in the south of the country. <laughs> Imagine how I felt when I eventually got to Sri Lanka as head of a program on economic insecurity several months later and on the beach where I was meant to be staying on my first few nights, there was a copy of one of my books. But more tragically, of course, thousand people were killed on that beach. And I worked watching how the international community reacted to that tragedy, that incredible tragedy. And over the next few months, of course, what happened was the aid agencies and the World Bank and the IMF included we're all running around the countries like headless chickens, uh, supplying vast quantities of fishing boats and fur coats, I saw, and all sorts of uh, crazy, crazy policies. And at the same time, I was arguing for the obvious uh, part of a, a response should have been pe giving people economic security, basic security. And I advocated then a basic income as part of the process, not a panacea, but a necessary part, a simplified, 
giving of people the capacity and the resources in which to start rebuilding their communities. Instead of which, of course, there suddenly became, instead of a shortage of fishing boats, there was a surplus of fishing boats, which actually led to an increase in the overfishing. Okay? And it was a... I remember having discussions with the local representatives at the highest level of the IMF and the, the World Bank. And I said, this, this sort of strategy is not giving the communities the capacity to rebuild themselves and the independence and autonomy. And this was, of course, absolutely devastating for women because many of the projects were actually biased in favor of men, breadwinners or whatever you want to call them. And so women were actually structurally discriminated against at a time when they really needed dramatic help. Now, here it was the international community not responding to the actual needs and freedoms of the Sri Lankan people, okay? And we have seen this all over the world. I worked in the United Nations for 30 years, and I saw it in many countries in different ways. And again and again and again, the international financial agencies wanted to restructure in favor of export-oriented growth and propping up finance. We've just seen it in Europe as well, in the COVID thing. The first thing the the governments did with all their Goldman Sachs appointees, I noticed the last government in Sri Lanka had their spate of, of Goldman Sachs appointees. And, and, you know, it's a global thing. I've called it Goldman Sachsism. They come in and they, they rush to strengthen a certain sector, which is not in the interest of the precariat. Now, we, if we can see it in this structural context, then, of course, there's one thing about responding to the immediacy of today's crisis in Sri Lanka. That I would listen to you, Shanta, with, with great respect, because I think responding immediately to the crisis. But at the same time, we have to be much more critical about the need to dismantle rentier capitalism and to look to the needs of the precariat, this mass of people that as a result of the restructuring are living lives of chronic uncertainty, insecurity, in chronic debt. And we're talking about it all over the world. Because finance thrives on people having debt. That's how they make their money. Let's be honest. I'm an economist. You're an economist. We know that finance actually thrives on putting people and institutions and governments into debt and inducing governments to give them subsidies. So finance has been the biggest beneficiary of subsidies and tax breaks. And this is, this is ridiculous. You're right to say that the lack of targeting of, of many transfer programs, many social programs, are disgracefully regressive. But it's far more regressive that the state is acting in the interests of the powerful and the big and the rentier states. And I think, I, I think we can have an agreement on some of this because now the question is, how do we restructure the dismantle rentier capitalism so you get a proper market economy and at the same time redistribute the income at the moment flowing overwhelmingly to the holders of property of different types? And I think that, that perspective should guide our thinking and maybe part of our discussion. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Professor Shanta, your thoughts? Sure. Um, no, I think it's amazing how, how much we agree on. Um, and let me just say that uh, I, I, too, have been advocating, and Guy must have seen some of my published articles, uh, about uh, converting most economic policies into cash transfers, uh, converting most subsidies into cash transfers, precisely for the reasons that he has, uh, he has articulated. Uh, the problem, and I've tried to do this in several countries around the world in my 30 years at the World Bank. The problem is, and, and so there's, there's no shortage of World Bank people who are advocating for these same things. The problem is the countries themselves, the governments. The this government of Sri Lanka would not have agreed 
to convert all that uh, assistance after the tsunami to cash transfers. I, 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 in fact, I, I happened to be the chief economist for South Asia at the time, and I remember having this discussion with them exactly on this issue during the tsunami uh, recovery. And there was, well, that, let's say that there were also concerns about, because it was in the middle of the, uh, the, the war, the civil war, and there were concerns about if you give it in cash, it can leak to the, to the other party, shall we say. Um, uh, and uh, so they wanted, they actually insisted that it actually be concrete uh, products that can't be transferred so easily. That said, I, I want to come back to a couple of things that Radhika said as well, which is, you know, what you described about austerity. Um, first, you know, Sri Lanka has already been through the austerity program. That's why I said they, they did an IMF program without the IMF. That was last year, 2022. If at all, thanks to the, if, if, assuming the, the IMF board approves this thing tomorrow, um, uh, the austerity will be much less going forward because what this foreign exchange uh, from the IMF and possibly from the World Bank and ADB does is it relaxes some of the import con controls. So now you can actually import more and that will relieve some of the shortages that people are, are facing, uh, are already facing. And that's one of the reasons for the increase in malnutrition and, and, and so on. But also it can help stimulate the economy. So this is a paradoxical situation where they've been through the IMF program without the IMF, and now when the IMF comes in, actually it's the it's the reverse of an austerity program. It's an, actually an improvement, but that's not going to solve the long-term problem of Sri Lanka. Absolutely not. And I think there, Radhika, you use the exact correct word, which is accountability, because I think that's what is lacking in Sri Lankan economic policy. I've, I've gone back and looked at the whole history of Sri Lankan economic policy, and it is all geared towards minimizing government accountability. And the, 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 re, the reason I cottoned on to this was when, I, when the Aragalaya movement was happening. And, and I remember seeing this poster, uh, this placard in the Aragalaya movement that said, uh, the people should not be afraid of the government the government should be afraid of the people. They got it right. That was the first time, I think, there was a countrywide movement that called a spade a spade. And frankly, I think a lot of these policies, including the social policies, like Samuti, like the Paddy Lands Act, and we can go into employment, but that's a, that's a longer conversation, have all been geared towards minimizing government accountability to the people. It's been disempowering the people of Sri Lanka. And cash transfers is a classic example of being able to employ people, uh, to empower people uh, in, in the country. So I think we really should exploit or harness the, this, this uh, realization that accountability is the key to bringing to reviving economic growth and making it inclusive in, in Sri Lanka at the moment. And I'm delighted if we can work together on this, because I think this is going to be the key uh, to uh, the, the future. Professor Sornaraja, I'd like to bring you in. Um, this is the second half of our uh, discussion. Um, in her recent report, Michelle Bachelet, speaking on Sri Lanka, addressed the need to combat economic crimes. Uh, this is the first time that economic crimes was mentioned. Um, we spoke uh, at length uh, over how political accountability um, has not really worked out. So how can uh, we ensure political accountability for economic crimes uh, can be ensured for Sri Lanka when it is the politicians themselves who are the legislators in Parliament? And I'd also like you to um, draw on um, the uh, legal doctrine around odious debt, which you've written extensively on. Uh, odious debt argues that sovereign debt should not be transferred to successor governments if it was incurred without the consent of and without benefiting the people. Uh, so if you could just briefly take us through this concept and how it could actually be put into practice in a timely and feasible manner. <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, I, I, being a lawyer, sort of look at most of these things from a legal point of view. And, you know, I think accountability or responsibility for economic crimes and other crimes is something that the Sri Lankan government is short on. As far as the law is concerned, as far as economic crimes are concerned, we have had uh, a long history of uh, legislation on uh, the outlawing of bribery. There have been bribery commissions in Sri Lanka for a long period of time. The difficulty simply is that those bribery commissions have been uh, uh, made up of appointees of uh, government politicians who have been thoroughly corrupt. So bribery commissions have not functioned effectively in Sri Lanka. Coming to the other legal positions, I mean, you asked me to explain the uh, issue of odious debt. But it's, uh, the, the notion of odious debt is associated with uh, a group of other doctrines. Like, for example, when a debt is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, given, it's based upon a contract which has to be signed by a public officer. And the officer should not sign that contract if uh, it exceeds his, uh, the limits of his authority. So one would think that uh, if the debt does not serve the interests of the public, then the, the officer should not sign that particular instrument. The, uh, si the, the, the contract that is signed by him in excess of his authority becomes what we call an ultra-virus contract, a contract signed without authority and therefore becomes a nullity. So I would say that most of the debts that have been, uh, that have been uh, given in Sri Lanka in recent times uh, would probably have to be examined carefully to see whether or not a public interest has been served by the granting of these debts. Then there are associated doctrines, like, for example, the doctrine of economic necessity. If there is an economic crisis and uh, this leads to a vast amount of public uh, suffering, uh, ch child new, uh, malnourishment, uh, deaths because of uh, starvation, then is there a duty on the part of uh, the government to prioritize the payment of uh, repayment of the debt over the, the, the suffering of the people? And I think it's clearly uh, the case that uh, they should be able to suspend the payment of debt. And this is uh, something that uh, I was involved in an argument in uh, an Argentine case called El Paso versus Argentina, before a World Bank tribunal called the Exit Tribunal. And the Exit Tribunal held that in circumstances of dire economic necessity, it would be possible to suspend the payment of the debt. So despite the fact that it would appear that the IMF and other international financial institutions would want to, private, want to prioritize the uh, repayment of the debt, international law has evolved doctrines which uh, would support the suspension on payment of debts. So there is also the other doctrine relating to odious debts. The doctrine of odious debts is that where it is pretty apparent that uh, the debt was given by the lender for a purpose which does not promote public interest, then uh, that debt it becomes suspicious and, of course, moves towards the idea that that debt is a nullity. So the debts that have been advanced in Sri Lanka, the debts relating to the construction of the Matale Airport, the most unused airport in the world, according to uh, the Forbes magazine, uh, airport that's used more by monkeys than by men or women. So this, this situation then uh, is uh, something that calls for closer analysis. Should we say that the lender in this case is, was acting properly was there an obligation on him to ensure that he does not give a debt uh, for a purpose which, uh, uh, which does not promote any public interest at all? So there, there are instances where you have to closely scrutinize each debt, each debt and see whether or not the uh, lender uh, uh, has uh, performed uh, 
uh, uh, do analysis of the debt as any bank in uh, the domestic sphere is expected to perform uh, rather than inflexibly apply the idea that uh, you have to repay a debt once uh, you borrow money from uh, an international lender, which seems to be the, the, the law that uh, the international financial associations, uh, institutions seem to be, uh, to be making. So there are then exceptions to this requirement to repay debts. Otherwise, you would be, you would be really uh, reading Shylock uh, out of Shakespeare. You know, there are Shylocks, and you have to provide for the fact that bad debts uh, are, have to be scrutinized, have perhaps to be uh, regarded as nullity, and of course this takes uh, into account the notion of accountability and uh, the requirement that there should be a proper basis for the giving of debts. Thank you. Professor Guy Standing, you too have written um, on uh, odious debt. Speak to us uh, with respect to predatory lenders and Shylocks, a lack of uh, political accountability, and at the end of all of that, the suffering of people as a result of short-sighted political mismanagement. Besides the, the notion of odious debt, which in fact was first formulated in 1927, so long predating the IMF or any of these things we've been discussing, there's also what I would call odious leverage. And this, I think, has become a very important part of globalized rentier capitalism. Odious leverage is when a country or an institution is induced to get into debt and the lender or others on the lender's behalf use that debt situation to induce or oblige some sort of behavioral change by the, the government or by that institution. And I think this has been a very important part of what's been taking place over the last 30 years. And I want to come back to something that I mentioned in response to Shanta's points at the beginning, which is I don't think this discussion should leave out the very explicit role of China in this whole unfolding saga. Because at the beginning of this century, China, of course, was not a member of the World Trade Organization and was, for a long period before that, it was not a country with capital, or not with international finance capabilities and so on. But that, of course, has dramatically changed since it joined the WTO in 2001, and it's become a major rentier state. And with its maritime Silk Road and the Belt and Braces strategy of forging across the world, Sri Lanka has been a sort of stopping post in the development of that strategy, and which they've been doing these white elephant projects that several of you've mentioned that uh, are, you know, are a disgrace for Sri Lanka. And I don't think the story should stop with talking about corrupt politicians, because that will that sidetracks. Of course, you've had more than your share of disgracefully corrupt politicians. We know that. And that is a figure of, you know, it's, it's a really sad aspect of Sri Lanka. But this is systemic in the sense that more and more countries have been induced to be having unsustainable debt and the leverage has been used, particularly by the, by the banks um, in the context of privatization. Now, I, Shanta, worked in the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. And I had to interact a lot with the World Bank and the IMF on the shock therapy that they were pursuing. And later in the 1990s, I was invited to the World Bank a number of times in, in Washington to give talks about social protection, reform of social protection. Now you yourself or me myself may have particular views, but I remember 100% that they were strongly against unconditional cash transfers. They were strongly for privatizing every part of the social state. I had huge rows with the head 
of the social protection sector, who is an Austrian, you will remember him. Um, and it was a time when we needed to restructure the state. And I believe that the outcome for the kleptocracy in the Soviet bloc countries is due to the fact that the World Bank and the IMF and the others deliberately wanted to downgrade the social state and led to uh, uh, a kleptocracy emerging. And this was being repeated in a number of developing countries. And then we come along and blame corrupt politicians when we haven't created the institutions of civil society, democracy, that would, that would stop people like that taking over. So I think that that, that is the, the context in which one should see these things. And at the moment, we have a terrifying situation where we have globalized debt exploding all around. I'm speaking from Switzerland, and we've just had the second biggest bank collapse. Credit Suisse is, and it's, it's a zone of corruption, if you like, but it's, it's, it's a financial crisis of enormous proportions. Whether they'll get through it this week, we'll find out in the next few days. But it's not just a Sri Lankan issue, it is a global issue. I mean, what, one of the things I, I want to say, I, I go back to sort of my, my work on, on using human rights norms and standards. What, one of the, the, the real missing links in all of this is extraterritorial obligations. And so we need to really look at the kind of international legal mechanisms that can hold extraterritorial uh, obligations of one state to the other. And also, you know, the kind of international consensus that we need to really challenge this current time, we don't have, right? I mean, so what agency is there uh, globally that is looking at these issues that Guy so eloquently just talked about in terms of, of uh, these uh, banks going under and, and the need for debt for the finance uh, financial sector, I think we really need to think about what kind of international consensus can we come to because we're at a moment, I think, in, in, in economic history where we're really looking at a, at a global crisis uh, and in terms of, of inequality, in terms of uh, power and, and structure, and then you, you see these rising of authoritarian states coming out of these, these moments that we're living in. And so I think we really need to think about what are extraterritorial obligations and what agencies do we need to put in place that can look at the social welfare of all the people uh, when these other neoliberal policies keep getting pushed in, in government's uh, face. All right, fantastic. Um, Professor Radhika, to salvage decades of ill-thought uh, policy, uh, successive governments in Sri Lanka have used a charity or welfare approach as a means to salvage the damage that they themselves have caused. So we find uh, bags of rice or dry rations um, being just distributed among the most vulnerable, a 5,000 rupee allowance which the family bre breadwinner can collect after standing for hours in a queue at the Grama Seva officer, the Samurdi benefits which uh, Professor Shanta also spoke of, um, or rice packets with the face of a politician plastered uh, on it. So this is deeply problematic, haphazard, uh, it lacks dignity at, at its very core and also has no scientific thinking behind it. Um, going forward, how do you think ethical considerations and dignity must be reintroduced, specifically uh, in the case of Sri Lanka? I mean, that, that's an important question, uh, not just in Sri Lanka, but I think everywhere, is, is to have... I mean, the idea that charity is the answer. I mean, this is this is happening uh, in, in many parts of the world. Uh, but I think if people understood that they were rights holders and then the burden of the, the state is to make sure that the rights holders get the rights that they uh, uh, are uh, allowed. Uh, and how do we change that structure from, yes, the, the bag of rice with the politician's face and saying that that's uh, somehow um, cash transfer programs. I think we need to really go back and look at 
at social protection at a much larger scale? And what is the obligation of the state in terms of providing social protection? And, and again, you know, I, I, I think we need to talk about what COVID really exposed. Uh, it was kind of a televised version of, of look at what inequality looks like is when the entire world economy stopped. And then we suddenly saw what was happening in the world. And, and the need for social protection. I mean, I was just thinking uh, the images that came to my mind were, uh, for example, in India, right in the beginning of COVID, you just saw all the migrant workers who had nowhere to go, right? And they had to be put on buses and sent. I mean, and the visual images of that were, are, are long lasting. That tells us that there's structurally something really wrong, right? When workers are uh, they're not needed, and then they're sent somewhere else, and and what are they supposed to do? So I think we need to have a paradigm shift, right? And we need to really think about, uh, as I, I started uh, my comments, why are we doing all of this? I mean, where is it that when 1% of the world's population has the wealth of the entire world, there's something structurally wrong. And if we go, you know, piecemeal and say, okay, well, Sri Lanka's government is, is corrupt and they did this, but I think we need to really, uh, this is a moment, I think, that we need to really rethink the economic paradigm that, that we're pushing forward and come up with a new way of analyzing uh, the, the, you know, the well, I mean, I think many countries, for example, are now, instead of looking at GDP growth as the only uh, way to assess whether an economy is doing well, but to look at well-being. And, and there are many countries that are looking at well-being indicators rather than GDP growth, because GDP growth, especially in terms of climate change, is not necessarily the way for us to go. So I think we need to spend more time looking at how do we look at the well-being of people and articulate that in a way in which it is robust it looks at issues of inequality and, and looks at issues of gender inequality uh, and then assess an economic policy based on those criterion rather than just did it increase growth. Professor Sornaraja, the state holds political power in trust uh, for the people. There's a fiduciary responsibility that vests in the state to enable and ensure that the best interests of the people um, are upheld. However, as to whether this happens practically is a whole other question. Um, my question to you specifically is, how must unethical and unconscionable governments be held to account when the role of legislation is limited? Sri Lanka, from uh, its uh, date of independence, has not had uh, any meaningful ideas relating to economic development. It has been sidetracked side into ethnic politics largely because that has been the most significant feature of uh, Sri Lankan politics for 75 years, at least, uh, no, if not 75 years, at least from 1956 when, uh, or, or, or perhaps earlier than that, with the, uh, with the, with the legislation that denied uh, citizenship to uh, the Indian estate workers. So here there is a sort of a program that ensured that uh, ethnicity was uh, the sole uh, or, 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 the, or the leading factor in uh, uh, politics of Sri Lanka, which was manipulated by, uh, by uh, popular politicians, first uh, resulting in a civil war, which lasted for 30 years. So there was a major setback to the economy of the country and the ethnic, uh, the, the, the ending of the ethnic war in 2009 has not solved the situation. In fact, it has uh, enhanced uh, the difficulties because as a result of uh, the ethnic war, militarization has taken place. There's a growth of an army which has to be maintained. So in that context, development is not going to take place in uh, the meaning, meaningful fu uh, future. So there is uh, a need then to solve uh, a lot of issues, which is not going to be solved by the uh, IMF uh, uh, loan that uh, is going to be received tomorrow. It's uh, a festering problem. And there are other festering problems, like uh, 
the system of patronage that has uh, developed in Sri Lanka, the maintenance of, uh, of uh, administrative power through the granting of favors, which of course uh, uh, leads for, to, to corruption. So this is an endemic situation in which uh, progress cannot take place. The existence of corruption, a kleptocracy as uh, it was mentioned, I think that's another feature of administration in Sri Lanka. So we have uh, laws, no doubt, but the laws are improperly administered by uh, uh, parliamentarians uh, who are not, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, is very evident from disclosures of qualifications, uh, capable of, uh, of uh, drafting legislation that is necessary in the context of uh, the present uh, situation. That it's not that uh, machinery is not lacking. Like say, for example, when it comes to corruption, uh, the Nigerian cases show that uh, Sania Bacha, the president of Nigeria, was uh, followed in several courts of the country, or, or of the world. Uh, the, the, the Swiss accounts were frozen by the Swiss courts. Money was recovered, some $3 billion were returned by the Swiss courts to, to Nigeria. There, there are programs provided by the IMF itself, which uh, would uh, ensure the following of uh, assets uh, of uh, corrupt officials. The World Bank runs a program, and it's all free of charge. You know, the United States government has such a program. So it's not as if there are no means of recovering stolen assets uh, uh, that are taken abroad, but there is no initiative on the part of uh, the Sri Lankan government to have recourse to these mechanisms. I'll stop there. Thank you. Professor Shanta, um, I keep thinking that there will be something hopeful that emanates from this uh, rich discourse. Um, we have about 20 minutes more, so there's still still hope. Um, uh, let's, let's come back to the IMF staff level agreement, which uses the term reduce corruption vulnerabilities. My question to you is, how is it possible to negotiate debt restructuring on behalf of Sri Lanka when there are very, very, very strong issues related to corruption, the rule of law, shutting down dissent? Absolutely. No, I think th this is a very interesting discussion because uh, th I, I, what I was going to say was that some of the discussion about the international system, including odious debt, and uh, uh, extraterritorial obligations. Um, I, I don't disagree with in the international sphere, but I think there are some very specific situations and circumstances in Sri Lanka that are very different. And let, let me just start with, you, you know, uh, Professor Sonaraja talked about uh, that we shouldn't make debt service payments, we should suspend debt service payments when there's such a, an increase in malnutrition. Well, guess what? In 2022, there was an increase in malnutrition and we made no debt service payments. That was the year we suspended debt service payments. So Sri Lanka has already done what you, what you have been advocating. That's not the issue here. Uh, the, 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 the issue and, and going forward, we're gonna reduce the debt service payments precisely for the reasons you mentioned because we can't tolerate these kinds of uh, uh, increases in malnutrition for, for, for the people. As I said in an op-ed about a year and a half ago, you know, you, you, don't, you don't starve your people to repay your creditors. That is just wrong. This, I, if, among other things, is something that Sri Lanka has already done. Now, uh, I want to take a little bit of an issue on the, uh, on the odious debt, again, with the fully agree with the principle that there is such a thing as odious debt, and it has happened in, in many countries. But I think the Sri Lankan case is a bit more nuanced. Uh, think about back in 2019, the Rajapaksa government refused a $500 million grant from the Millennium Challenge Corporation. That was a grant, no interest. You don't have to pay it back. And it refused a $1.5 billion loan from the Japanese at 0.1% interest. And they went ahead and borrowed from the Chinese at 2 3% interest, right? Why did they do that? 
it's going back to, I think Professor Sonaraja brought this up, or maybe Radhika, uh, it's the human rights issue. They, they associated the Americans and the Japanese, for some reason, as part of this group from the human, UN Human Rights Council that are pressuring Sri Lanka to uh, investigate uh, truth and reconciliation. So they didn't want to uh, borrow from these much cheaper creditors, and they would rather borrow from the Chinese who don't bother them about human rights violations and things like that. That was a Sri Lankan decision. I don't think that's odious debt. I mean, unless you think that the Chinese should also impose human rights conditions. But I think that the, the real mistake was Sri Lanka was practicing foreign policy with its economic policy. And that was a mistake. I think you should, you should have a separation between foreign policy and economic policy. You can debate the human rights issues at the UN Human Rights Council. But when it comes to borrowing, when it comes to your credit policy, borrow from the cheapest lender and don't uh, create a, a debt trap. Then finally, the, the, the other point I want to... Oh, oh, and by the way, parenthetically, uh, Professor Sanaraja, you, you, you pointed out this, uh, what's called the STAR initiative that the World Bank and the UN have, uh, uh, have which is to re recover stolen assets. It stands for Stolen Asset Recovery. And the interesting thing is they had started this during the Yaha Palania government, uh, investigating the previous Rajapaksa administration, uh, and that made some progress, but then the government fell. Um, and so it has been suspended. Now, the interesting thing is President Ranil Vikramasinghe actually said this in his uh, Rajasena speech uh, just a month ago, saying that we're going to revive the STAR initiative. So, uh, and we have made progress. I've actually went back and checked with the people, they are ready to pick up where they left off. They have done some investigation. They can continue. So I think there is some hope that this government will actually uh, undertake some uh, 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 stolen asset recovery. And I, I, I've worked on this in Tunisia and, and a few other countries as well. We, we, we can bring something to account. So again, Sonali, if you wanted some uh, potential good news, uh, this, this may be uh, hopeful. But I, I just want to say one thing about um, education and health, because uh, uh, Radhika raised this earlier about uh, uh, IMF programs cutting spending on health and education, uh, and then uh, she mentioned COVID. So, you know, just first, as a matter of fact, IMF programs in general over the last 15 years have explicitly put constraints on cutting health and education spending. You cannot lower health and education spending as part of the austerity program. So it is actually a constraint rather than uh, something that they, they advocate. They advocate against it. And the Sri Lankan program in particular does not include any cuts in health and education. Indeed, what we're trying, what, we're, what we have proposed, and it's in the budget uh, of 2022, uh, which is to, to cut these unproductive expenditures like energy subsidies and use the money you save. Some of it has to go to targeted cash transfers, but use some money you save to increase spending on health and education and social protection, because these are the under underinvested uh, parts of the, the, the system. So, you know, okay. So, the, but then... Let me say something coming back to our human rights discussion earlier, which is just spending on health and education does not guarantee that you get health and education out the door, right? And again, this is one of those things that Sri Lanka has actually done very badly. And, and the world as a whole is failing. I mean, th this, this grand touted education system that everybody celebrates and Sri Lankans are very proud of their education system, right? It has guaranteed, it has managed to achieve secondary enrollment, 100, almost 100% secondary enrollment, which is quite an achievement, right? But 50% of the students in eighth grade do not pass the eighth grade exam. So the, the students are going to school, they are attending school every day, but only half of them seem to be learning enough to go to the next step, right? 
The other thing is that there's a significant uh, uh, degree of teacher absenteeism. It's about 20%. So one in five days, the teacher's not there, which is, then might explain why the students aren't learning. And then f the, the third thing that concerns me is, the, 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 you know, Sri Lankans are very proud of the fact that they say we have a free education system. But then you look at how much private tutoring there is. Almost all families, and this, the, the, the distressing thing is this goes from the richest to the poorest, are paying to, to get their children, to give their children tuition, often from the same teachers who are teaching in public schools. The teachers are under teaching in public schools because they're not accountable. And then they become star, star teachers. And there's some recent evidence that the, 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 the expenditure on private tutoring in the poorest quartile, it, it, about 60% of the people in the poorest quartile are spending money on private tutoring. So the so-called free education system is not even working for the poor. And then, I mean, there are problems with the higher education system, but I won't go into that. Now, I, just to conclude, on COVID, you're, you're absolutely right. COVID exposed a lot of the limitations of the system. But keep in mind that the system was not great to begin with. So learning outcomes in India were, were worse than in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, and in Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda, they were even worse than that. Right? So the, these kids were not learning in school. And then they were unable to go to school because of COVID. And so we've seen that the learning, uh, the, uh, the learning losses are even greater in these places. But what we should do is use this as a lesson to say, let's do something about that education system, especially that education system we are so proud of, uh, but it's not working for the poor. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Guy Standing, you have some remarks? I, yes. Um, um, first of all, quick response to uh, Shanta's remarks on education. I think the, the criticism of the education reforms in the last 30 years are pretty universal. All the phenomena that you've mentioned, I've written about as, as a global. I mean, the cramming business, the, the sort of privatization of a secondary informal schooling alongside a dysfunctional uh, education system, but you can actually go back to the way that the orientation of education in general was in the 1970s and 1980s, a shift to human capital and competitiveness and the schooling having a different function. But I think that should be left out of our discussion uh, because we're, we're deviating a bit from our original thing. But I, I think that is a very interesting set of, of issues to discuss. The second point I'd like to respond to is Radhika's, um, Radhika's comments, with which I have much agreement. Except let me say that I don't think this is best framed in terms of a 1% against a 99%. If you look at the, the nature of the inequalities, and I, I interact a lot with the Oxfam people who wrote that report that you mentioned, and I have a lot of respect for them. But this is not a 1%, 99%. That's the tragedy. If it was, it would be actually quite a lot easier. The fact is that about a quarter of the population in every country has been doing very well out of rentier capitalism. They've been doing very well. If you are a middle-class property owner in the United States or in Britain or in Germany, you have actually done very well because you're sitting on property, and property values, land values have gone up. It's the, the precariat, which is growing to becoming a majority class, as, as my books show, that have been increasingly insecure, vulnerable to shocks, and living in a context of economic uncertainty. And that, is, that concept of economic uncertainty is very, very important for political understanding, because it's no use trying to put the social policy back into the sort of welfare state mold of the beverage or Bismarckian welfare states of the post-1990 
1945 era. Because we're mm -hmm. not facing contingency risks, as we call it, we're facing systemic vulnerability because it's economic uncertainty. Unknown unknowns. And that leads me back to the point I would like to say uh, to our, our esteemed uh, rac rapporteur, as it were, which is that there is a good message to come. There is a positive message. In 1986, I and a small group founded Bien, which was initially Basic Income European Network. A lot of people thought we were nutty, dangerous, etc., and we became the Earth Network, Basic Income Earth Network. We have thousands of people joined that network. And I've been very privileged to be able to put into practice something that I passionately believe in, which is that everybody in any society could have a basic income to provide for their basic needs with dignity. Okay? Yeah. And I've, we've done it in Madhya Pradesh, thousands of people in, in various areas. We've provided with a basic income for two years. We did it in West Delhi. We've done it in, in Kenya. We've done it in Namibia. We've done it in various places. I'm currently advising the government of Wales, where they're providing a basic income for a whole lot of young people. We've seen it in South Korea. There are more than 100 pilots at the moment and every day people seem to write to me about them, uh, asking for technical advice, where people are being provided with a basic income. And what is happening with that is it's empowering people, it's giving people dignity, it's, remo it's moving away from what you correctly said, Radhika, about the charity state. It's a terrible thing, the charity state. It lacks dignity, and I don't, and even the high level philanthropists like Bill Gates, who magnanimously choose where to give some of their money to, it's, it's not dignifying. It shouldn't be left to individual plutocrats to determine which cause gets support and which cause doesn't get support. We need a structural reform. So I would say to Shanta and anybody else listening, that in the context of trying to respond to this systemic crisis in Sri Lanka, that we put something like that, which is a universal, not a targeted, means-tested, because that creates poverty traps and behavior traps, but, but actually give people a sense of dignity. What we found with the pilots is that people increase their work, not decrease it. It increases the emancipation of women. It increases output, and it reduces inequalities in communities. And it induces more social solidarity. So I think now is the time at this sort of darkest point of the tunnel, as it were, where we've got to move forward in, with a, a vision of a good society based on dismantling the things I was talking about earlier, the subsidy system, the tax breaks for, for vested interests that get the ears of the politician, to moving away to resurrecting the commons, because ultimately the commons is what makes society. And in the last 30 years, as I've tried to show in my books, we've seen a diminution of the commons, and either by the state or by private finance. The commons is in the middle, and it's been squeezed by these contesting ideologies that we've been talking about. So I think this is a transformational moment, potentially. Or we could go into a dark night where the whole lot of world is ruled by a Modi's and Trump's and Boris Johnson's <laughs> and all of these terrifying people, right? So it, at the moment, we should have a positive message. And I just hope that people in Sri Lanka, in positions of authority, can be brave enough to, to move the debate forward. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to uh, wrap up uh, this discussion. So um, in two minutes, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Radhika 
for your closing remarks to speak to us about how in, in your writing throughout decades of your work, you speak so audaciously of challenging the dominant economic paradigm to dare to view through a human rights and social justice lens how economic recovery uh, must take place. Uh, speak to us um, about how this can be possible and not just a theoretical construct. Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with Guy that we're at a moment in history where we have to have a paradigm shift because we are going to that, what you said, the dark tunnel. We're, we're there. And if we don't have a paradigm shift, I have no idea where we're going to end up with the, with, with in, in, in the world. Uh, I mean, my own work has been really to try and say that, you know, because most people, when they think about human rights, they only think about civil and political rights and not economic, social, and cultural rights. And I think if we expand the notion of human rights to encompass all of this, then basic income would be a part of the human rights framework, right? It's not divorced. And, and when we think about progressive economic thinking and heterodox economic thinking, feminist economic thinking, they're completely compatible with human rights norms and standards. And so the new paradigm shift would be if we were to take the world economy, the national economy, and evaluate it and audit it in terms of its human rights uh, obligations, we would have a very different economy. And in the, in the book that, that I did with my colleagues, we said, uh, we use this term tinta, which is there is no technocratic answer, but there's, there's also a process. It's an accountability issue. It's about how we evaluate each economic paradigm in terms of the fulfillment of human rights and well-being of its of it, of the people, I mean, you know, UNDP started using, um, you know, the Human Rights Index. I mean, the Human Development Index in order to sort of give a challenge to the growth GDP idea. But I think we need to go beyond that and really reframe the way we think about economic policy. And I think. If there was ever a moment, this is the, this is the moment because I think we're in this place where we could go really wrong, or we can really do some kind of shift and move to a place in which we have a, a better set. I mean, uh, just that that we don't live in a, in a, in a world where you know thirty percent are malnourished and hungry and homeless. I mean, that's just that's a shame. So how do we change that? I think is to really take out the dominant framework and say that we need a new paradigm shift. And I think we can all come together and figure out what that is. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Radhika. Um, Professor Sornaraja, uh, your closing remarks. Something we see in Sri Lanka in its interactions with bilateral, multilateral parties is that there is an overwhelming representation of politicians and underwhelming representation of technical experts who are able to negotiate on behalf of Sri Lanka with Sri Lanka's best interests at heart. Um, Sri Lankan citizens can't be constantly second-guessing its governments. There must be more transparency. There must be more ethical governance. Is this too much to ask? Well, you know, it's a, a rhetorical question, you know, in a sense. And, uh, you know, I'm, I think we all have been, I mean, at different levels advocating paradigm shifts. And from my point of view, I have look, looked at international law as a creation of uh, the powerful states. And, of course, international financial law is but an example of that idea that the constructs of the law are based upon power. The uh, International Monetary Fund being a classic example where voting rights are based upon the amount of contributions of states. So it's very difficult to have a paradigm shift in the context of that situation. In Sri Lanka, uh, when it comes to the commons, the commons are reflected by the 6.9 million people who voted for the previous government and who are the basis. That election was the basis of the present government. So paradigm shift is not going to be possible. And one would hope that uh, in the context of uh, this economic crisis that's ongoing, Sri Lanka would try to effect uh, a paradigm shift by favoring a solution that uh, the alternative structures like the uh, United Nations uh, 
conference on uh, trade and development would advocate that you look at every uh, every loan that has been given in uh, the particular context of that loan. And I would also hope that they would uh, that this uh, ongoing crisis, and of course we see that it's a crisis that affects uh, a lot of other developing countries, not only Sri Lanka, but Zambia, Lebanon, and other countries, that there would be a revival of uh, an earlier effort to bring about a structural change in international economics. The new international economic order that was uh, prominent in the 1970s and was given up. I think we have to aim at uh, a global resuscitation or revival of uh, a resistance movement to the existing international economic structure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Professor Guy, standing your closing remarks. Um, given the fact that we identified just during the course of these past two hours so many issues in the Sri Lankan context uh, and also globally, uh, speak to us um, as to how Sri Lanka could find solutions in this deeply problematic setup? Fundamentally, whatever we talk about transformation and the response to the crisis, we have an existential crisis, which is that nature is being denuded and greenhouse ga gas emissions are rising. We're destroying nature in the oceans, as my new book is showing, and we can do a lot to revive the commons and revive nature. And I think when we talk about well-being, we must talk about not only the well-being of men and women and children, but well-being of our ecosystems, our species, because we've got to restore a balance in the way we live. And I, I've been using the concept of commoning because commoning connects us with nature and puts use values and reproduction at the heart of whatever strategy we develop. And for me, this is an, a, a, an integrated approach, which is fundamentally different from the state socialism of communism and the <laughs> privatized neoliberal model of capital growth, growth, growth orientation. And if we can get that, I think we will appeal to the precariat. People will start thinking about what are the necessary structural reforms, what are the necessary voice mechanisms that are needed, and rebuilding that sense of community. I'm very struck when I've come to Sri Lanka that deep in the system of society, there are those reproductive values but we've seen them all over the world being you know, demonized or marginalized or whatever you want to say. And I think that the new model has to put that back in the heart. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Professor Shanta Devarajan, you function as uh, an advisor on debt restructuring and multilateral engagement on behalf of the Sri Lankan government. What is the way forward for Sri Lanka? fully endorse what Guy was saying about basic income, and uh, you've, I've, I've written papers on the same subject, mostly in the context <clears throat> of resource-rich countries in Africa, but the, the principles remain. And I think we can implement this in Sri Lanka today. We've had these discussions. I've had these discussions in government, and usually the, the response is, well, if we try to do universal basic income today, we don't have the resources. So if I could just add one <laughs> <laughs> sentence, <laughs> which is why not take the new money that is coming in from the IMF, World Bank, ADB, and pilot. use that for universal basic income, right? You don't, you don't need to use it to increase subsidies and, and, and spend on all sorts of crazy projects. Use it for empowering the poor. That is, what, that is what this universal basic income is about. It's about dignity, as, as Radhika said, but it's also about empowerment. And this is where we give people agency with which to uh, manage their lives. And that's the, that's the critical ingredient in moving forward in Sri Lanka. So we can do it.
All right, thank you very much um, for joining in this discourse on ushering in Sri Lanka's economic recovery uh, in a holistic manner. We uh, did try to view it from a human rights lens as well. Thank you so much uh, to the extraordinary guests who joined us on this uh, panel discussion. Professor Guy Standing joining us from Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Radhika Balakrishnan joining us from New York, USA. Professor Muthukumara Swami Sarna Raja joining from Jaffna, Sri Lanka. And also Professor Shantadev Rajan joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your expertise, for your time, for caring enough. Uh, thank you. And that was this edition of the People's Platform Special International Edition. Thank you for joining in the conversation. We'll see you again soon.